Kjære alle sammen, velkommen til Fritt Ord og dette seminar om journalistikkens status i Norge og 36 andre land. Navnet mitt er Knut Ola Vågås og er direktør i Stiftelsen Fritt Ord. This event takes place in partnership with the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism at Oxford University. And Richard Fletcher is here to uh, present the uh, international report. Special welcome to you. And also welcome to Professor Halla Moore from uh, the University of Bergen, responsible for the Norwegian version of uh, the report and the more detailed analysis to be found there. And there are perhaps a few hardback copies left, but uh, it's easily available on Fitwo's website. We are very grateful for this contribution from the Bergen researchers. Uh, the Fritor Foundation has a, has a good and long-term cooperation with the Reuters Institute, co-funding some of its research, and uh, every year we also send one Norwegian journalist to Oxford to work on the project for half a year with a scholarship. Uh, Heidi Tokstad Shesef was our fellow last year for six months, working on uh, right-wing populists and their relation to media in the US and Europe. Happy to see you here too, and soon in the panel. <clears throat> uh, Richard Fletcher's um, introduction will be in uh, English, and then the main parts of this seminar will be in Norwegian. Bare noen få ord til om det å støtte uavhengig journalistikk. Det er et viktig område for fritt ord, og det vil det være i årene som kommer også. Og I fjor høst lanserte vi et kraftig utvidet journalistikkprogram, norsk journalistikk, der vi har satt av inntil 100 millioner kroner over fire år. Journalistikken befinner seg jo i en krevende situasjon fortsatt. Jeg vil si at det beste som blir skatt av journalistikk i Norge i dag sannsynligvis er bedre enn noen gang. Bare litt for lite av den. Men samtidig ser vi at det fortsatt er store problemer med å finansiere den. Vi har globale plattformer og teknologiaktører som ikke produserer journalistikk selv, som overtar det meste av annonsintektene. Og brukerbetalingen, det begynner å komme seg, men det monner ikke helt til å være økonomisk bærekraftig enda i Norge. Og midt oppi alt dette så sliter altså journalistikken med lav tillit fra borgerne. Og vi ser kampanjer, konspirasjonsteorier og politiske ideologiske angrep som forsøker å svekke denne tilliten ytterligere. Og nettopp dette spørsmålet, hvilke medier har vi tillit til, det er hovedtemaet her i dag. Hvordan er borgernes tillit til etablerte og nye medier? Hvordan kan vi si at nyhetene er eller blir politisert? Og hva betyr den skjevt fordelte viljen til å betale for journalistikk? Den, den fordeler seg ujevnt i befolkningen. Hva betyr det for demokratiet i mediesamfunnet? Så i denne situasjonen trenger vi politisk kunnskap om journalistikkens status og brukernes forhold til journalistikken. Og det gir Digital News Report 2018 fra Reuters Institute oss konkrete fakta og innsikter som vi kan sammenligne på tvers av nå hele 37 land. Det øker fra år til år. Og sammenligningene her er interessant i seg selv. Og, og grafikken som Reuters produserer er også veldig god. <tøk> De siste to årene har Norge vært, ja dette har vært tredje år, er det ikke det? Tredje år Norge er inkludert i rapporten med en bevingning fra fritt ord. Og de to siste årene har vi i tillegg fått medieforskere ved Universitetet i Bergen, altså for å lage en egen liten analyse på norsk. Alt dette skal vi nå få høre mer om og diskutere de neste knappe 90 minuttene, og i tillegg til de jeg har nevnt sitter Hans Ruster, redaktør i Dokumentet NHO, og Gadmi Karlsen, redaktør i Media24 i Panera. Velkommen igjen til alle, og da gir jeg ordet til ordstyreren for dette arrangementet, moderator som heter i dag Kjersti Løken Stavrum, direktør i Stiftelsen Tinius, og tidligere generalsekretær i Norges Presseforbund. Vær så god. Takk. Til trøst or not to trust, I think, maybe, that is the question for the future of media. Or is it? Is it a question not to entertain or not to entertain? 
Or is it a question of being political biased or not being political biased? We're going to discuss that later on. But first, I have the privilege to introduce you to Richard Fletcher. He is uh, the main lead researcher of this um, digital news report. He's won in total five men that are responsible for the report. His research fellow at the Reuters Institute of the Study of Journalism, primarily interested in global trends in digital news, but also the use of social media by journalists and news organizations, and more broadly, the relationship between computer-based technologies and journalism. He's in Norway for the second time, and uh, we're sorry that you weren't here two weeks ago when it was warmer and more sunny, but anyway, <laughs> thank you for visiting us, and thank you for taking us through the highlights in the report. Please. Uh, thank you. Um, this is the seventh um, digital news report project uh, that we've worked on, and I'm delighted to be here in Oslo uh, to tell you about it. Um, we launched the report uh, in London, uh, Berlin and New York at the end of last week, uh, and I'm very pleased to be here uh, to talk to you for the first time about uh, some of the international findings and also bring in some of the, the context from Norway uh, as well. Um, and this is the uh, largest um, uh, survey of news consumption in the world, uh, we think. Uh, we surveyed over 74,000 people uh, this year across 37 different countries uh, and five continents. The focus is on Europe, where we conduct research uh, in 24 countries, including Bulgaria uh, for the first time. But we also have uh, coverage in Asia-Pacific, Latin America and North America as well. I should say that this is an online poll, so it is representative of people who have internet access and not national populations. And as such, in countries where internet penetration is low, uh, the data will underrepresent certain behaviours such as TV, print, uh, and radio use. <laughs> um, our polling is conducted by YouGov, and we have a range of partners, um, including uh, Brit Ord and a range of other organisations such as Google. Uh, regulators, the BBC, and research institutes and universities uh, from across the world. I've been asked to talk about some of the, the global findings, and I'm going to talk about five main themes uh, in particular. Uh, firstly, we're seeing a really significant change in how people are using social media for news. Uh, in particular, we're seeing Facebook becoming less important uh, as part of people's news diets. We see a heightened sense of concern about what some people have called fake news, but not just in the US, we see this across the world, and it's often whipped up by the media and also politicians. And we think this has impl implications not just for tech platforms, but also uh, for journalists and media organisations as well. There are some interesting trends emerging surrounding business models, uh, not least uh, membership and donations. We're publishing uh, brand-level trust scores for the first time across 37 different countries, and these have a lot to tell us about how different types of news brands uh, compare to each other. And finally, we're seeing uh, emerging signs of the potential of podcasting and also voice technologies, uh, opening up new uh, opportunities for on-demand audio. But for most of the last seven years, one of the consistent themes in our data has been the growth of social media as a source of news. But we're now seeing signs that this is beginning to reverse. Uh, social media for news is down nine percentage points uh, in the US and 20 percentage points amongst the younger groups. Um, we see similar declines uh, in the UK and France, uh, but not everywhere. So in Germany, the numbers are essentially stable, but the growth has stopped almost everywhere. If we dig slightly more deeply into the data and look at individual networks, we can see that uh, the decline in social media use for news is primarily about uh, declines in Facebook use uh, for news. This chart averages data from 12 countries where we have uh, data going back to 2013. Uh, and we can see that for news, uh, Facebook has started to decline in 2016 and this decline has continued. Uh, for other networks such as WhatsApp, we start seeing growth, so going from 5% uh, in 2013 to 15% for news. But the important point here is that if you look at the data for Facebook use 
uh, overall, uh, the line is flat. So people are not coming off Facebook, but they are using it less uh, for news. We think there are uh, three reasons uh, for this shift. Uh, part of the reason, of course, is to do with Facebook's own decision to deprioritize news uh, in favor of what they call more meaningful uh, interactions. But we also find in our focus group research uh, people expressing uh, frustrations and a sense of boredom and feeling that other social networks are becoming more enticing. And this is particularly true for younger people. So this is a quote from one of our focus groups uh, in the US, making the point that these networks, such as WhatsApp, feel uh, more relevant and more convenient. And Snapchat, which I know is also popular in Norway, was very important for people after certain incidents, such as the, the Florida shootings, as this snap map uh, demonstrates. Now, it's certainly true that uh, people are still using Facebook uh, to discover news, uh, but at the same time, uh, we also find the conversation about news is moving to more private spaces. And this is partly because of something that some people have called context collapse, where networks essentially get too big, so people do not feel like they're talking to their real friends uh, anymore. And this comment from a participant in Germany uh, illustrates that. In other countries, the harsher political climate and the polarisation of opinions uh, has accelerated this trend. And some people in the UK here talking about pulling back from Facebook because they feel uh, they're uncomfortable with the nature of the <coughs> political discussion and their lack of control uh, over it. Which brings us on to trust in the news. Um, and our headline figures for trust uh, are generally quite stable uh, year on year with around 44% of people across all the countries included saying they trust news, most news uh, most of the time. The numbers are slightly higher for the number of people who say they trust the sources they use, but we can also see that the figures are, are lower, so trust is less widespread uh, in uh, certain news from search engines and also news uh, from social media. In Norway, the figures for the bubbles on the uh, on the left hand side are, are slightly higher than the, the all country average, but lower in the case of this month. One of the things that uh, we know that Facebook are doing uh, is polling their community and asking which news sources they trust in order to feed this back into their algorithm to decide which news sources to, to show to people. Facebook, of course, are not going to publish this data. But we have asked a similar or conducted similar research and we can publish this data for, for 37 different countries. These are the scores uh, for the US. Uh, the purple bars reflect uh, the scores of all those who have heard of particular news brands. Um, we ask people to rank them on a 10 point scale ranging from completely untrustworthy to completely trustworthy. Uh, and as we can see here, local news uh, is trusted uh, the most in the US. And Fox and Breitbart at the bottom, uh, the least. Um, but there's also, as you can see, a second set of scores, and these reflect the trust that people who actually use these sources have. And when we look at that data, we can see that some of the more partisan brands, like Breitbart, uh, tend to do better amongst their users and actually move themselves above some of the other brands uh, on the list. In Norway, uh, we see a slightly different picture. So the most trusted brand in our survey was uh, the public broadcaster. This is fairly typical for countries in Western and Northern Europe. Next, we see the uh, newspaper, some newspaper brands. It's slightly <laughs> unusual uh, for uh, European countries. Often we see TV in sort of second and third uh, place. But again, alternative sources of news uh, are nearer the bottom. But again, if we, uh, if we look at just their users, they tend to, tend to do better and are more in amongst the, the mix. Um, in terms of uh, what some people have called fake news, we understand that this is a deeply problematic term, <clears throat> but it's also one that participants in our focus groups started using spontaneously in a way they didn't uh, a year ago. So it's very much entered into the vernacular. Um, and our survey shows high levels of concern from people about uh, what is real and what is fake on the internet when it comes to news. But as ever, there were big national variations. So concern was highest of all uh, in Brazil and also Spain, where this has been an issue in recent uh, debates about Catalan independence. Um, 
But as you can see from the other end of the chart, concern is much lower in countries like Germany, the Netherlands, and also Norway. And here we have less polarised environments, and in countries which have recently held elections, this hasn't been as big an issue as it has in other places. Um, I've already mentioned the idea that politicians have not helped uh, in this regard, um, and we've uh, try to measure this by asking people whether they came across the use of the term fake news in order to undermine media uh, they don't like. 49% uh, say that they've seen this behaviour uh, in the US. And also, we see similar figures for countries with uh, populist uh, governments such as Hungary uh, and Turkey. Uh, the figure for Norway is lower at 27%, uh, and even this might, be, might include some, uh, some international coverage. Uh, in terms of um, other forms of misinformation, it's perhaps uh, not surprising that audiences have a different view of what constitutes uh, fake news and what doesn't. And often this co combines long-standing concerns about bias, uh, spin, and poor journalism. When we ask people whether they think they've come across any of these uh, in the last week, 42% uh, uh, say that they have seen uh, examples of poor journalism in the last week. 39% say that they uh, have seen spin or agenda-filled news, but only 26% uh, say they've seen or thought they had seen news that was completely made up for commercial or political uh, purposes. In Norway, uh, the figures are lower, but particularly for uh, examples of made-up news, only 14% say they think they've seen this uh, in the last week. And taking these figures uh, into consideration is perhaps not surprising, that we, um, uh, when we ask who has the biggest responsibility to fix the problem, most people uh, say that publishers should do more, followed by uh, platforms and technology companies, and last, uh, governments. Um, we didn't ask about specific forms of regulation, but in terms of whether governments should do more, we find quite a big variation between uh, Europe, uh, where 60% of people think governments should do more, uh, and the US. So where just uh, 4 in 10 say the same. And in Germany, where regulation has already been uh, introduced, we see differences of opinion uh, in our focus group data as well. In the US, uh, it's linked, very much linked to debates about uh, free speech. <coughs> Moving on to some of the uh, business issues, and in terms of paying for digital news, uh, we're seeing more people subscribing and more people also donating to news organisations. Uh, last year, we saw a big jump uh, in payment uh, for news, uh, digital payments for news in the US, uh, jumping from 9% of the population to 16%. And this figure has held steady uh, in the last year. Um, this is more than twice the rate uh, in some European countries, such as uh, the UK at 7%, and Germany uh, on 8%. But it's really the Nordic countries that lead the way in this regard, uh, with 22% across the region paying for online news uh, in, some, in some form uh, in the last year. And we've also seen that it's not just uh, national publishers that are able to charge, but also some local publishers uh, as well. <coughs> and part of this is linked to the idea, uh, the realisation amongst some smaller parts of the public that journalism costs money uh, and needs it to keep going. Um, Subscription is unlikely as a model to work in every country, uh, or even for the majority. So it's interesting to see that uh, membership and donations are emerging as an option in a number of countries. So the Guardian, in particular in the UK, uh, is selling the idea that uh, people should give their money in order to keep news and the internet more generally uh, open. And this idea is starting to resonate with younger people. 600,000 uh, people in the UK have contributed in the last year, by an ongoing membership or a one-off donation. And The Guardian uh, hopes to break even for the first time uh, in the next year. Um, it is worth bearing in mind that uh, this is only represents about 1% of the population still. Uh, the figure is 2% uh, in the US and 3% in Spain. But it's striking that 22% of people say that they might be prepared to donate to a news organisation in the future if they're unable to cover their costs. Uh, in other ways. 
But again, this is a this is a minority view. And when we asked people uh, how much they knew about the the, st the financial state of the uh, news industry, we found that 68% of our sample across the globe are either unaware of the difficulties that most media companies face, and even some of this uh, uh, this group even thinks that some me most media organisations make a profit uh, online. Uh, and in response, what we tried to do was develop a, a model of news literacy. So we asked our respondents a series of factual questions about how the news is made and how the industry uh, works. And this allowed us to uh, divide people into uh, those with high levels of news literacy and low levels of news literacy. And what we find is that people with higher levels of news literacy become more likely uh, to be willing to make a donation or more likely to pay for news. And I think this suggests that it's very important for media companies to get their messaging right about their, about their situation and why uh, their finances are important. I want to say a few things about uh, public service broadcasting and one of the benefits of a survey like this is that it allows us to put the Norwegian uh, case into a, a broader context. On this chart, I show the online news reach uh, for public broadcasters, which is the light, lighter colour, next to the offline reach, so broadcast and radio news reach of, uh, of public broadcasters. And as we can see, in, in every case, um, the offline reach is higher than the online reach. But we also see a kind of two-tier system uh, emerging, where some public broadcasters, particularly those uh, in northern and western Europe, which are well-funded, and have a strong reputation, have been better able to reach certain groups, and their reach online uh, is higher. Uh, in Mediterranean countries, and also in Eastern Europe, uh, we see that the, the reach compared to the offline reach of public broadcasters is, is less than a third in some cases. And in some of these countries, there are, there are restrictions in terms of what um, uh, the PSB is allowed to do online, but also there are differences in culture and politics. Of course, the, the commercial argument is that public broadcasters represent uh, unfair competition to commercial providers who are attempting to charge uh, for content, but it's worth bearing in mind a couple of things we think. The first is that uh, those in some countries where PSPs are very strong and very well funded, uh, we also see people uh, are willing uh, to pay. And secondly, what this chart shows is a unique reach for PSPs online, that is to say the proportion of people who only use the public broadcaster as a source of news is low in every case. Perhaps the partial exception to this is the BBC, where 14% of the population only use the BBC online for news, but the figure for NRK in Norway is, is just 1%. On trust, going back to our brand trust scores, we see that in most countries, particularly again in Northern and Western Europe, uh, the public broadcaster has the highest level of trust of any brand type uh, in that country. Uh, however, in other parts of Europe, such as Spain and Hungary, where political uh, interference is greater and the uh, broadcaster is seen as less independent, these are actually the least trusted group compared to digital board, print and broadcaster brand. The final thing I want to talk about uh, is what some people are referring to as the reinvention of audio. So firstly, uh, voice or voice activated speakers or smart speakers as they're sometimes called. Uh, we've tracked these uh, for a couple of years now where we can see that in terms of the number of people who own these devices, uh, in the countries where they've been around the longest, uh, we've seen the figure double uh, to 9% uh, in the US. 7% uh, in the UK, and up to 6% uh, in Germany. Um, in terms of uh, what these devices are actually used for, slightly unusually for new devices, uh, news isn't the most common uh, thing that they're used for. Um, a lot of it is about accessing music uh, or doing things around the home, but 65% of owners say that they regularly use them to access weather, and 44% say uh, Alexa, tell me the news, or Google, tell me the news. So it is a significant part of their usage. We think that uh, this is also driving interest in uh, podcasting, and we've done more research on this uh, in the last year. Uh, we can see that the podcasts are, though the latest news at least, are most popular in the US. The figures in Norway are slightly lower, and lowest of all uh, in the UK, 18%. Perhaps the most <coughs> interesting thing is the... Uh, 
the demographic differences in terms of use when we compare it to radio news. This is a slightly unfair comparison because we're comparing uh, weekly radio use with monthly podcast figures. Uh, but nonetheless, the, the demographic differences are quite striking. So uh, amongst under 35s, around half say they use a news-related podcast uh, each month. But less than 20% of that same group are listening to radio or radio news. In terms of what programs or podcasts people are actually using, we've seen enormous range. Uh, this is data from the UK where we ask people to list uh, the podcast that they regularly use. Um, there's about 100 different BBC programs in there. Uh, but also, interestingly, uh, a lot of US productions, such as This American Life and Freakonomics and others too. And what we think this is, the reason we think this is important is because it, it shows that there's a potential for um, audio or audio-based news to, to be more diverse and it, the, the range of uh, political opinions uh, to be increased. And it's not something we're necessarily used to, to seeing in audio, but it is something that could happen uh, with podcasts. So to wrap up, uh, these are some of the, the main themes and also some suggestions uh, for uh, discussion. So one of the implications of Facebook's change of direction on news, is there a danger uh, that relying more on trust scores uh, from Facebook might squeeze out diversity and choice that we're used to seeing uh, in technology uh, platforms. Uh, should publishers and platforms do more to deal with the reality uh, and the concern over so-called fake news? Should we be more optimistic about some of the business models associated with digital news? And what about voice? Is it an opportunity as well as a, a challenge? Thank you, and I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you.